This episode is sponsored by Circle and Bloom. Circle and Bloom has created an amazing offer for the Fertility Friday community. Make sure to head over to circlebloom.com slash fertility Friday to get your free relaxation program. And don't forget to enter the coupon code fertility Friday at checkout to get 20% off of anything you buy. This is the Fertility Friday podcast, episode number 108. Welcome to the 108th episode of the Fertility Friday podcast. Thank you for joining me today. I'm Lisa from fertilityfriday.com, and this is your source for information about the fertility awareness and all things fertility. Before I jump into today's interview, I just wanted to take a moment and let you know about my new group programs that are coming out in January. I recently completed my 10-week group program that I had going on since August. We started in mid-August. And it was just an amazing experience. So I was working with a small group of women. We met every single week. And not only did we delve into fertility awareness charting and really get a handle on what all the mucus stuff means and how to sort it all out, we also really started to get a handle on what's happening. What are the underlying factors that are contributing to cycle irregularities? And so it was just my complete privilege and honor to work with such an amazing group of women and to see how they were supporting each other and there for each other. So let me tell you, there's just something really powerful about working in a group. And I know that firsthand because that's how I learned to chart as well. And so that's why I'm so passionate about creating that experience and opportunity for you. And I'd also like to share with you what one of my clients recently said about her experience. I'm always somebody who's a learner for in multiple ways, whether it's, it always starts with reading, but reading the book didn't take me to the knowledge that I've had from working with you individually, Lisa, and as a group. What I've learned together as a group is so much more than I would ever get from just my own chart, because every time we're learning from each other, not just about the chart themselves, but about people, about their lives, what they're going through, and you don't feel alone. And you really have a way, Lisa, about bringing everybody together to feel that they're not alone, but also how can we all help each other? When you're learning together, it makes you feel like you're not alone, you're not screwing things up. Everyone has different ways of learning that they share with the group that helps. So it might be a long-winded way of saying it, but I would not have been able to do this much or learn as much as I have, you know, except through the group. So make sure to head over to fertilityfriday.com slash group program for more information. I just wanted to take a moment to thank my sponsor, Circle and Bloom. I am so thrilled to be working with such a great company. And to be honest, I've had just an incredible amount of positive feedback from my clients, from my listeners, from the members of the Fertility Friday Facebook community and otherwise members of the community in general. Every time I post about Circle and Bloom, somebody comments and just thanks me for partnering with such a great company. I couldn't have asked just for a better uh, business relationship with a company that's so supportive of my audience. And so one of the things that I really love about the programs through Circle and Bloom is just the the detail and the intention behind them. So for example, the Natural Cycle Fertility Program, which is one that I've spoken about before, it takes you through a 28-day cycle where each visualization is unique and different based on what's happening in your cycle at that time. So we all know by now that all of our cycles are not always 28 days. But the beauty of charting is that you can actually pinpoint where you are in your cycle. So you can listen to the visualization at the right time and you know what time that you're at when you're charting your cycles. And so I would encourage uh, you to head over to circlebloom.com slash fertility Friday and make sure to download your free fertility relaxation MP3. And if you do choose to purchase any of Circle and Bloom's programs, just remember to enter the discount code Fertility Friday at checkout to redeem your 20% discount, which is super generous. So thank you, Circle and Bloom. And without further ado, let's jump into today's episode. And today I'm very excited to welcome my guest, Vicki Braun, to the show. Vicki is a master fertility awareness consultant, trained and certified in four different methods of natural family planning. She is also a certified GAPS practitioner, 
She has a bachelor's degree in biology and chemistry and a master's degree in microbiology. She writes and speaks on natural family planning, balancing hormones, and healing the gut. She has taught natural family planning for over 30 years and has consulted with thousands of women. She combines natural family planning and her knowledge of hormonal imbalances with a focus on gut health in order to help people restore hormonal balance through diet and lifestyle changes. And as any of my long-term listeners know, those are three of my favorite topics, <laughs> uh, natural family planning or fertility awareness, gut health and hormonal health. So this is what we'll be talking about in today's episode. And I'm really excited to have uh, Vicki on the show. So thank you so much for being here. Welcome to the show, Vicki. All right, Lisa, I'm delighted to be here and I look forward to speaking on a topic that's very near and dear to my heart. Well, I would love to jump in and just get to know you a little bit better and hear a little bit about what inspired you to work in this area and also how did you discover natural family planning? All right, it's an interesting um, interesting story I have. My interest in natural family planning started many decades ago uh, when I was dating my now husband of 40 years and my older sister actually introduced me to the concept of fertility awareness when I was in graduate school dating uh, my husband, Rich, at the time. And she had just been made aware of it herself. She's, she was married and wanted to use that as a way to naturally space her children. At the time, since I was just dating, Rich had no uh, real interest other than it seemed, it seemed like a concept that, that would, would be something that I might use in the future if and when I did marry. I was in graduate school at the time, very busy uh, doing research, taking classwork and so forth. So I didn't have any uh, use for it at the moment, but that was, she was the one that in initiated my interest. And then at when it was time for us to get married, we were doing our marriage preparation work um, with the clergy person that we were going to be married um, in the church. We were going to be married and he had influenced both of us to do some missionary work, some volunteer missionary work in Canada, no less, British Columbia, Lisa. So mm. we've been to Canada a number of times over the years, but that was our introduction to living with Canadians, and we really enjoyed it. But anyway, so we, we made a commitment of two years of volunteer work in um, the Diocese of Prince George, uh, British Columbia, it was back in 1976 to 1978. And um, the priest that was preparing us for marriage um, told us about this wonderful couple that he had met because he had spent a couple of years uh, doing some volunteer work as well with the same organization. So he said, get, get to know this couple. And sure enough, we did uh, meet them. And right away, they just clicked their personality, their down to earth interest in life and fertility awareness. They told us about um, natural family planning at the time. And they were certified in a program that I believe is still in operation in Canada called Serena Canada, which is, or at least was back then, a government funded family planning program, which emphasized the natural family planning. So we attended one of their classes. And from the get go, we just, we knew that that natural fertility awareness was something that we wanted. We had just been married a few months prior to that. And we were looking for a way to plan our families in a natural way. My husband, Rich, did not want me to go on the birth control pill. We had heard and read things about it that didn't excite us at all. So that's kind of where we started. Um, and from that time on, uh, Roy and Diane Fuller, the name of the couple who introduced us first to natural family planning, was the couple that taught us Serena Canada, and we then were trained to become teachers in Canada. Never had much of a chance to actually teach it because by the time we got through the training and were certified, we had already com almost completed our two-year volunteer um, stint with the organization that we work for. So we came back to the United States and the Fullers told us, be sure to get a hold of an, this other organization called the Couple to Couple League. And so we did. 
when we got back to the States, and then we actually trained and certified for them, which was also is also a symptothermal method of fertility awareness. Symptothermal meaning there's uh, usually a temperature sign that's taken, a waking basal temperature sign, plus a mucus or cervical fluid sign, and sometimes an optional change or characteristic of the cervix cervix itself, which changes uh, when the hormones changes. So we, we, we went through and started uh, teaching natural family planning for the Couple to Couple League, and that was back in 1979. Mm-hmm. So we've actually been teaching for that organization ever since. And in the meantime, I also found out, well, my husband and I both were really excited about this whole natural family planning stuff. And, and for many years, we wanted to actually work for an organization that promoted that. So my husband got a chance at working for the Couple to Couple League back in 1999. And so we jumped at that opportunity, moved our family from the state of Wisconsin down to Cincinnati, Ohio, where the international office is located, and started working for the Couple to Couple League. He, Rich started first, and then I worked my way in a year or two later, working part-time and eventually full-time. Uh, both of us have since retired from the Couple to Couple League, but I've just started my own consulting business because I enjoy my work so much. And during the time um, that I was working for the Couple to Couple League, of course, that's when I had the most experience with consulting thousands of women. And so I heard lots of stories, um, lots of questions that piqued my interest in learning more about the cervical fluid or mucus sign, because I found that that really tended to be the key in understanding what was going on with the woman's hormones. And the symptothermal method uh, does train us in the mucus method, but it also uses the temperature sign as a cross check. So what I found in cases where women were not getting those shifts in the temperature indicating that an ovulation had occurred, they would not be comfortable with interpreting their fertility signs, as the, the mucus sign. So I wanted to learn more about that. So that's what prompted me to search for uh, some sort of method of natural family planning that taught just the mucus sign. And uh, I was fortunate in coming across two different methods. One is called the Family of America's Method, who just happened to be training some teachers within an hour's drive from Cincinnati, Ohio. And that's the first place I went to to get more training with the mucus method. And then later on, just a few years ago, actually, I went and got uh, further training and certification with uh, the Billings Ovulation Method which is a mucus-only method of natural family planning as well. So the combination of those extra mucus method NFP trainings helped me to understand the patterns of discharge that women were experiencing during their postpartum transitions, during transitions um, as they were entering into menopause, uh, during longer cycles where women are having, you know, not the, not the typical, normal, healthy type cycle. And they, were, they would be having longer cycles without an indication that ovulation and a thermal shift had occurred. So this extra training enabled me to understand what was going on hormonally with these women and then also to help them interpret that mucus sign so that they would not need to, if they were trying to, let's say, postpone or avoid a pregnancy, they would not need to abstain for long periods of time. And that has been uh, an enormous uh, blessing for me just to know that information. Mm -hmm. Well, I'd love to delve into that a little bit more. Thank you for, for sharing that. One of the questions that occurred to me is, was it the work that you did with women that prompted you to, to want that additional training? When you work with women through fertility awareness, through natural family planning, and you're helping to teach women to chart their cycles, you start to see patterns. 
And so I would imagine that one of the patterns that you started to see over and over again were these extended patterns of cervical mucus. Um, And as you alluded to, that would mean that if a woman's trying to prevent pregnancy, she would have such a long period of time in her cycle where she'd have to be abstaining. That's correct, Lisa. Yes. Um, In fact, another thing that I learned in these extra trainings is that discharge can occur not only from the cervix itself, and that is correctly termed a cervical mucus or cervical fluid, but the vaginal walls and the vaginal environment can actually excrete or secrete some material too, depending upon the level of estrogen that is being uh, produced at the time. And the pattern of the discharge, so that's why sometimes I refer to cervical mucus as discharge, because the discharge may actually be something coming from the vaginal walls, which would be normal, but it's not technically or correctly called cervical mucus because it doesn't originate from um, the cervix itself. So uh, you may hear me refer to it as discharge sometime during this interview. But the pattern, the pattern of the discharge actually provides the key to understanding whether the woman is actually fertile or not. And I have learned about that through the wonderful work of the late Professor James Brown from Australia. He actually developed over a period of decades a system of understanding the discharge pattern and correlating that with actual hormonal tests from women's urine output and correlating the two together so that he can then understand whether the pattern of discharge was actually a sign that the woman was going to ovulate or produce that egg and become fertile, or not. And so that's that's been real uh, a treasure for me to understand that pattern of discharge. And so a woman may have discharge. She may have a pattern that alternates between not feeling or seeing anything to feeling and seeing something. And the feeling and seeing something could actually vary a bit, but It could go back and forth to that type of uh, 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 no discharge versus some discharge, but it uh, and the type can actually be a combination that ends up being an infertile combination. Which you know, when we first learned about fertility awareness, we learned basically all methods teach us when you first notice any sort of discharge, then you have to assume fertility. But what the late Professor James Brown found was that, okay, the discharge means something. It means a certain level of estrogen production, whether it's enough to uh, progress to an ovulation or not, or just enough uh, to cause a secretion possibly just from the vaginal walls. Mm -hmm. And by watching that pattern of discharge, progress over a period of time, depending upon the situation of the woman. Let's say the woman has had a baby. She's nursing her baby. If she has this pattern of discharge that occurs over a period of approximately two weeks or 14 days, that pattern can be studied and reviewed by a a consultant or a, a, a natural family planning trained person who understands these patterns then they can actually determine from that pattern whether that's a sign of fertility or not. So by the end of the two weeks in a situation like that, the couple can know uh, whether they need to continue to abstain if they're trying to postpone a pregnancy or not, or if they can resume uh, relations with each other. So it's a wonderful thing. And even women who are not in a transition time, Let's say they're having cycles, 35, 40 day cycles, maybe a little bit longer cycles due to some stress or something like that. Women like that can actually have a pattern of infertile discharge as well. But the requirements for for determining that are a bit different because she is a cycling woman. 
knowledge about those patterns has really opened up a whole new avenue for me in understanding the woman's um, fertility signs. Mm -hmm. Well, for the listeners who might not be so familiar then with this concept, it's managing a basic infertile pattern. And so to get into kind of more of that, you know, fertility awareness jargon, then every woman who's cycling does have a quote unquote basic infertile pattern. What that means is that, you know, there's days of your cycle that you're fertile and there's days of your cycle that are not. So if you're, you know, a typical healthy cycling woman, then your infertile pattern would be your dry days. So you would expect to have, you know, several dry days after your period, and then you'd go into your fertile window where you'd observe mucus. And then after ovulation, your mucus would dry up, and then you would have several dry days. But some women don't have that, <laughs> that pattern. And that's what you're referring to. Am I correct? So, so women who, yes. instead of having their dry days, they always have some sort of discharge, as you're calling it, uh, cervical mucus, I would, I would refer to it as mucus probably, but regardless of what we refer to it as, if a woman has some sort of observation of some sort of mucus or discharge every single day, or, you know, one of the questions I get a lot from listeners is, you know, how do I manage the postpartum period after I've had a baby? Many women who are breastfeeding postpartum then will have this, uh, you know, an observation of mucus all the time. <laughs> but it is possible to manage your fertility and use fertility awareness or natural family planning, even if you have that observation. But it is a, a, a totally, I, I feel like with that, it's, a, it's, it's almost like the second level of difficulty. It really requires you working with someone, as you alluded to, who really does understand how to interpret these patterns and how to guide the woman as to how to differentiate between her basic and fertile pattern and her true days of fertility. Exactly. Yeah, that's exactly correct, Elisa. Yeah, I would not uh, want to encourage women to try to do that on their own unless they've had a proper training and, like you said, work with somebody who can guide you through that. Yeah, because it's a complicated thing we're talking about here. It's it's differentiating between different types of mucus. And especially if you're not using a particular charting system. So, I mean, whatever charting system you're using. I'm trained in the Justice charting system. Um, and you, you know, spoke about getting training in the Billings uh, ovulation system as well as what was the other one that you mentioned? The f- uh- I mentioned the family of the Americas and family that, of the Americas. Just, yeah, that was, that's a mucus system also, um, started by a Mercedes Wilson many years ago, um, initially to help women in the poorer developing countries on Central America, but it has moved through the States and, and other countries as well. But I, yeah, I first became aware of some of the background research regarding the mucus, cervical mucus itself at the Family of America's teacher training that I attended. And then um, later on, of course, learned more when I um, pursued the training with the Billings ovulation method. I know, and I I don't know about Canada, Lisa, and maybe you can share with me about that too, but in the United States, the main NFP methods are, we could call like the couple to couple league method. The Billings ovulation method has a presence here as well. And um, the fertility care, um, Dr. Hilger's uh, fertility care system, which is a mucus only method. But I think of the main methods, uh, except for the Billings method, the methods here in the United States tend not to be as aware of or as cognizant of the great work that Professor, the late Professor James Brown did, and also the work of Dr. Eric Odeblad, who is, uh, he's in his late 80s, I believe, probably now, but he lives in Sweden, and he has conducted a tremendous amount of research involving differentiating, as you had mentioned, Lisa, some of the different types of mucus that are actually produced in specific crypts or sites in the cervix itself. And what's really interesting is this Dr. Oldblad has found that not only are there different types of mucus, but there are many different types and many different types of crypts or uh, cells lining the cervical canal that produce these different types of mucus. And that actually a few of these types of so-called mucus 
are actually totally infertile mucus. Mm-hmm. So, so that's kind of interesting too. And, and, and of course, there's reasons for all of that. And he elucidated them through his years of research. But that has made, uh, that's made it very helpful for me in um, just understanding, okay, there's certain types of mucus that we don't have to worry about because those are not, uh, don't allow sperm to migrate through them because of the quality of them. And they are produced Some of them are produced, or at least one type is produced um, at the end of a woman's menstrual period and uh, up until the time that the cervical mucus that is potentially fertile starts to be produced. And then again, after the woman ovulates and becomes infertile later on in the cycle, then there's another type of cervical mucus that is produced and seals off the actual opening to the cervix and prevents anything from entering into the cervix, into the uterine cavity for the rest of the cycle. So it's actually a a natural, normal, you know, immuno, immunity type material that helps um, seal off contaminants or bacteria or anything that shouldn't be getting into the uterus during that time of the cycle. So that's kind of neat. I found lots of neat things <laughs> to help me understand uh, a woman's pattern. Well, yeah, no, I, it's funny because I was saying something like that similar, something similar to that to one of my clients today when I was describing the the mucus plug that you're talking about. And I was basically saying, you know, Mother Nature is so smart. It, the uterus is is an internal organ it's inside our body so if if there's no reason for something to be going up there then mother nature is going to seal that off just like you said and prevent anything because there's no unless there's a reason you have no business in there so she's going to seal it off exactly mother nature's design of the body is is really perfect and uh, we just need to understand it and respect it well absolutely and you know as you were talking i think that there's a question here. I'd love to hear your perspective on it, especially after your years of teaching thousands of women. Nowadays, information is getting way more accessible. And that's one of the great things about, you know, me being able to do this podcast and sharing this information with women all over the world. And I think that every woman has the right to understand and know how her body works. That's the the foundational belief that made me kind of start this podcast. And the fact that information is more accessible now, I think it it also comes with this idea that just because it's accessible means that it's some sort somehow necessarily easy or simple. Even just the the short conversation that we've had so far, when we're describing the different types of mucus, and you're talking about uh, Dr. Eric Odblad's work, and it's fascinating. Um, if anyone's like a super science geek, to to look into it, where he has all these different pictures of the ferning patterns of the different mucus. And so he really identified the different different kinds, different crypts, what they do, their impact, how they work, the role that they play um, in the whole process of fertility. But for all the women there who are trying to teach themselves, it's it's almost like it's complicated and it's not. From your experience then all these years, what do you want women to know? Uh, so for the listener who's learning about the method, she's trying to, you know, figure it out on her own. Uh, what advice or encouragement do you have for her uh, to kind of navigate through this process of learning fertility awareness? Ah, oh, excellent question, Lisa. I think I would encourage uh, women who are trying to learn this to maybe get a coach or an instructor, go through with a method first that that has some trained instructors so that many of the questions that she will probably have as she's learning to observe and interpret her own signs, she will be able to get answers to, uh, you know, readily. And I think that's really important. I mean, I know there are lots of fertility awareness apps out there. I know lots of women uh, do use those, but they don't, they don't really teach what the woman needs to know to understand fully her own particular specific cycle. So I would encourage women to look for, you know, a method of natural family planning or fertility awareness where you can just pepper the instructor with questions because 
invariably you will have some as your first learning. If you have very regular, typical type cycles, um, you know, and you know you've got healthy fertility, there's no issues with your cycles, that type of thing, you might be able to just read the book and get by uh, very easily. But I have found that lots of women tend to have not that kind of a cycle and so they tend to have more questions as they're learning but you know it's just I think it's you know tend to just try try your best at, at uh, either getting a, a, a textbook a book of some sort or going with a, a method of fertility awareness where you can work with a, a coach or an instructor of some sort. I agree and what I would say is, you know, the more I work with clients, the more that it's apparent that this is not something that, um, although in the end, it's simple, right? I mean, any woman who's learned the method thoroughly can attest that after the learning stage, it's super simple. (laughs) (laughs) But not until you've gone through that stage of learning. (laughs) And, And the thing is, too, Lisa, and you know this very well, I'm sure, is that Um, If the woman has the typical regular type cycle and she can really almost predict herself what it's going to be like, that gets to be very, very easy. But what tends to happen over a period of of a woman's fertile years is that she'll have an occasional odd type of cycle or she'll have a baby or several babies and the transition time or that she'll be entering into those premenopause years where her cycle will start to change. And um, I found frequently that women who get accustomed to their their natural regular cycle get sometimes discombobulated because when they come across a cycle that is not their norm, and that's where extra instruction or consulting with a, a, you know a, a trained instructor can be real helpful. Yeah, no, absolutely. And it's, um, and when you're, when you work with a trained instructor, they've also had the training in the different ways that a cycle can present and also having that knowledge of why it might be presenting that way. And I know that just in and of itself is, is so helpful to every woman I work with to be able to provide yes. them with a, well, you know, I've seen this before. It's common or normal in this situation. And this is why it might be happening. Right. Not to worry about, you know, because we've been so indoctrinated with this 28 day cycle thing that anything outside of it, you think you're uh, you think there's something wrong with you immediately. And, you, you know, you're you're you must be broken or something, uh, <laughs> something like that. And, and, and really, it's the body. Again, it's Mother Nature's design. If something is happening to us women, you know, whether it be stress, uh, athletic training, uh you're having a baby and breastfeeding. These are natural times when the woman's body does something different to prevent or not allow for a regular type of healthy ovulation. It's it's you you don't want the body to to be able to get pregnant if you're training for a marathon. It wouldn't be that wouldn't be a natural, normal thing to do. So the body then, you know, shuts down and the ovaries don't uh, cite, you know, don't produce eggs once a month and so forth. So it's actually natural for the body not to do that. It's just that, like you said, women are so indoctrinated with thinking that they got to have this regular cycle all the time that when they don't, they, they really think that something is wrong now. Of course, yes, if the woman is trying to get pregnant, she shouldn't probably be training for a marathon because, uh, you know, the body can't do two things well at one time for in that case. So it's 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 a, a priority that the woman would have to make a decision on. Mm-hmm. Well, and to switch gears a little bit, I know you alluded to how the cervical mucus pr- presentation and pattern can tell us a whole lot about what's happening with our hormonal levels. And one of the things that I wanted to talk to you about is, you know, at what point in your practice did you start incorporating 
that knowledge and awareness of the impact of diet on fertility. Um, so as a GAPS practitioner as well, that's a, another topic as well that I want to tackle, which is the connection between, you know, fertility and gut health. But um, was it something that uh, you just naturally kind of looked into or was it something that was informed by the experiences you were having with women to start looking into how to improve fertility through diet? Right. Um, my initial, my initial uh, interest in, uh, of course, is in the sciences. But early on, the couple in Canada who introduced us initially to uh, actual formal instruction in natural family planning were also interested in diet. And they had such a down-to-earth, unassuming uh, type of way of, int- of, of sharing this information that, it, for me, I, I just gobbled that up. I was that was something I was very interested in was nutrition, and so they started me on that path to understanding more about nutrition. But it wasn't until about 1999 or 2000 that I became familiar with the Weston A. Price Foundation, and then a lot of my questions were, uh, you know answered because I found out about how important fat-soluble vitamins were for producing sex hormones. And then I thought, well, jeepers, you know, if that's, that's the case, well, you know, we women, we need to be eating foods that contain those fat-soluble vitamins. So the Weston A. Price Foundation was an excellent initiation for me into learning about what types of foods and the types of vitamins that and minerals that were necessary for healthy fertility cycles. But it wasn't until I actually learned about the gut connection to hormonal health, and this was probably maybe five, six years ago, when I first heard Dr. Natasha Campbell McBride speak at one of the Weston A. Price conferences. And it was at that time when I learned that there was a definite connection between what's going on with the gut microbiome uh, and our hormones and so and I could see I was still doing this consulting uh, with the couple to couple league and I could see uh, there were lots and lots of women calling for help and I found that they were having issues with their cycles whether it be premenstrual syndrome polycystic ovarian syndrome endometriosis painful periods you name it, they had lots of different issues going on with their fertility cycles. And then I could actually see that, okay, there is a, there is a connection because Dr. Natasha mentions that though she's done most of her work with behavioral, uh, neurological and autoimmune type things, she has seen over the years of working with patients that when they address their gut issues and heal it, their hormonal fertility-related issues also are reversed. So I thought this is a perfect fit for me to get involved and get trained as a GAPS practitioner because then I could combine that knowledge with my knowledge of fertility awareness and women's, uh, you know, fertility issues to help them heal in a natural way. Mm -hmm. Well, I'd love to hear more about that. And so since becoming trained then as a GAPS practitioner, and also working with women, um, you know, teaching natural family planning, how has that kind of marriage of those two knowledge bases, how has that informed your practice um, and changed the way that you work with women? Uh, Sometimes it's, it's a delicate situation, Lisa, because women, as you are very much aware of, I'm sure, women have been sold a bill of goods related to the reproductive system that if they take a pill or do something quick, a quick fix, that their fertility-related issues will resolve. And in their minds, they feel that the resolution, meaning if they take something like a birth control pill to, quote, regulate their cycle, that they will be healed. That is an interior thinking of their own, but in reality, this is not the case, um, that, that 
these types of band-aid approaches do not actually heal the woman. So, so that's that's those are the type of women that I work with that 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 have come from using birth control pills or have issues with their cycles and maybe don't want to uh, you know go to their doctor and get that pill, but they're hoping that all they need to do is tell me which vitamin I need to take. And somehow that will correct my problem. So uh, it's, it's, uh, sometimes it's a difficult sell <laughs> to try mm-hmm. to help them understand that what's going on in their body is a, a reflection of what their gut flora um, balance is about. And so, but I love doing that because I can see, I can see what's what happening. It's working. Women who are sick and tired of, of going, getting the pills from their uh, physicians are demanding to find a way to correct their hormonal imbalances. So those kinds of women, of course, are easier to work with, but you have to approach them with encouragement that this took X number of years to get to this point in their body and it will take time to resolve. It may not take that same number of years, but it may take a year or two or more. And again, that is a paradigm shift that many women have to make because they tend to think that, okay, give me a month or two that I should be able to do that, you know, figure it out in a month or two. But if I have to do a year, that's a pretty long time. So it's well worth it because I've seen women um, make the changes and resolve their issues and uh, really produce a wow type of moment with their physicians when they see that their blood results and their hormone check is uh, back normal, their their cycles are normal, and uh, they didn't have to take any medication for that. Mm-hmm. So, <laughs> so it's, it's a wonderful thing to see, but it requires patience and diligence. And um, those are virtues that all of us, I suppose, can uh, are in need of you know, developing better, I suppose you could say. Yeah, well, it just reminds me of an interview that I did recently. So recently I interviewed Dr. Dan Kalish, Dr. Daniel Kalish, and he, you know, created the Kalish method and he teaches it. And one of the things that I remember from our interview is he was talking about some of the things that could be barriers essentially to fertility and getting pregnant. And so he spoke about, you know, gut infections and gut health. And that's one of the big kind of three of his program. And one of the things that he spoke about was that if, if, if you do certain types of testing and determine that you do have some sort of gut infection or some sort of overgrowth, so if your gut flora is essentially messed up, Yes. And then you address it. Um, mm-hmm. In his words, I, and I'm, uh, this is not verbatim, but he basically said, oftentimes if a woman has some sort of gut issue, gut infection, gut dysbiosis, once you address it, then she becomes pregnant very easily. That's how he described yes. it. But the actual work of addressing it um, is obviously not going to be like you take a pill and then you're good like in a week. That's exactly right. So, <laughs> yes. Exactly. So, yeah, it took X number of years for most of us women who have a hormonal imbalance to get to the point of where we are at the moment. And it takes time then to to switch that around and bring the good bacteria back in and um, depress those opportunistic microbes that are taking over and producing all sorts of toxins and and bringing that back into a state of balance. But, it, it, you know, the thing is, is it can be done. But again, this is where a good coach uh, comes in awful handy. And I've learned this from my own personal experience, trying to do the GAPS program uh, to not so much for my hormonal balance, but for other gut-related issues that I have had. So so actually the having the personal experience has given me a lot better um, empathy for people who who um, are in need of healing of the gut and who would like to pursue it. Um, I can help answer their questions a lot better, but I can also give them a perspective from a personal, personal standpoint that 
yes, it can be done. These are the kind of stages that you're going to go through. You're going to experience these kinds of things. Yes, that's normal. Um, hang in there, you know, uh, give yourself some time um, to heal and so forth. So it is, it's a journey, but it's well worth the time and diligence required to, to get to the other end of the road. Well, and one of the things that he did speak about as well that rings true because it's not easy is basically, you know, what you're saying. You're saying this is not like what I'm offering you is not an easy road. But um, one of the things that also stuck with me from that interview was that he said, he said a lot of the women who come to see me, they don't feel good. Like they just, they don't feel good. They don't, um, have that like kind of light, you know, that energy because they're sick. They're not well. So if a person has a gut infection or gut dysbiosis, they are not feeling good. They're not well. And even if it might not be that they, you know, it's may not be so like obvious because as you alluded to these things, these dysbioses or, uh, kind of things that are off balance in our bodies, they did take years to get there. It's, they did not happen overnight. And so this gradual process of kind of feeling not so great, you might not realize how bad you actually feel <laughs> if you felt that way for a long time. And so, I, I mean, although it's not an easy road, if you're able to go through and kind of, you know, persevere and really address those issues, not only does your fertility improve at the end of it, but you feel better. Exactly. That's correct. Yeah, it's there's such a dramatic change overall and the, the thing is is that many many of us don't don't uh and i i didn't uh, understand initially when i first heard dr natasha speak i didn't really totally understand the depth of what she was talking about um and because it's only over time and experience and and studying the material and learning what can happen that that we understand how important the gut flora is in controlling our entire body, basically. When you think about, um, I, I use this kind of an analogy to kind of get people thinking, oh my gosh, you know, the, our body cells, if we just uh, understand uh, like the number of cells in our body that comprise our body structure, you know, all the different organs and so forth. Um, is, you know, in the trillions, let's, I, I've seen different numbers, you know, coming up. So, so a certain number of trillion number of cells, but when comparing that to the number of critters, I'm going to say critters, hmm. because it could mean parasites, it can be viruses, it can be bacteria, fungi, and so forth. These critters, the number of them that make up our entire inner ecosystem is like 10 times that amount, approximately 10 times the amount of the number of cells that we have in the structural part of our body that we think is our body, okay? That we, that we you know, realize is, okay, that's our body. Well, we've got inside of our body in this inner ecosystem and our, di our whole um, digestive system, uh, 10 times the, the number of individual cells or uh, genetic sets of material that control so much of what's going on in our body, from the production of vitamins, the ability to assimilate minerals, uh, the, you know, the immune system, the ama massive amount of immune system, all these kinds of things. It, it, it's extensive what those uh, critters can do good and bad in our body. And that's why we really need to take more note of them. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah, it's so it's so important. And I, for some reason, it just it's not at the forefront, and, and it really should be. And so having the, I guess, the benefit of the knowledge of gut health, as well as the knowledge of fertility awareness, what would be some of the things that would trigger you to ask a client um, and to really encourage them to delve into this further and further look into their gut health? What are some of the ways that this might present on a woman's chart okay. if she does have some sort of gut-related issue? All right. Um, one of the things that can be monitored fairly easily on a symptothermal chart 
would be the level of the waking temperatures that have been recorded on the chart. An overall lower level of temperatures can indicate thyroid malfunction or some even over production of thyroid um, if the temperatures are very high. So, so temperature wise on a chart, you can, uh, you can tell a fair amount from the levels of the temperature, but you can also tell from both a symptom thermal chart and a mucus only method type of chart, you can tell other things. You can tell the length of the period of time that occurs after the woman ovulates or releases that egg each cycle. If that length of time is you know, 12, 13, 14, 15 days uh, approximately each time, then that's a pretty normal, what is called or referred to as a luteal phase of her cycle. That would be considered normal. But if she's charting the fertility signs and she notices that she's only got seven, eight, six days, nine days after that peak fertile day when ovulation or the release of the egg tends to occur, then she knows that she's not got a sufficient length luteal phase to support a pregnancy should she be trying to conceive. So that's one thing that can be easily seen on a on a fertility chart. Another thing that can be determined um, is the pattern of the discharge itself. Does it progress and develop into more and more fertile, ending in the what we would refer to as the peak type fertile mucus, the very lubricative slippery sensations, um, the egg white to stringy type mucus. If, if she gets a progression or developing pattern over a period, maybe five to seven days in a younger woman, that's a, that's a normal type progression ending in that peak fertile mucus. But if she only has one or two days and she's a young woman, that's another signal that she is not producing sufficient hormones to uh, help her achieve a pregnancy. And so, so those types of things I can see on a chart. The, uh, the fact that you can tell uh, the length um, and the type of uh, bleeding pattern she has, that gives an indication too of whether her hormones are balanced as well. So it, when I see things like that on a chart, I, I, I may ask the lady, you know, how, how are you feeling? Do you have any premenstrual irritability, any types of symptoms like that, especially her luteal phase is short. Um, I, I may ask her, you know, how heavy is your menstrual flow and type of thing. So we can, we can determine lots of things just by looking at the chart and asking some pertinent questions of the lady um, to, to determine more. And I, I, then I tend to open up the discussion. You know what? If you're feeling bloated during the time you're at your peak mucus, that's not normal. That's not normal. The, the body's design, nature, Mother Nature didn't design us to have terrible bloating during that time of the cycle or to have uh, to be massively irritable uh, the last week before we get our periods, something like that. Those signs, those signs are, are signs of a, a gut, gut that's out of balance. And so I can equate those signs with uh, the what she's noticing on her chart. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's really interesting how many different things you can pick up from a woman's chart. And so as we gear towards the end of our interview today, we've touched a little bit on diet and gut health, but maybe you could share with us some of the dietary principles that you you do um, encourage your clients to follow and some of the kind of nutritional guidelines for fertility that have been inspired with your work through the GAPS um, training and everything, as well as your work with the Western A. Price Foundation. One of the two, the, the, the most interesting thing that I found from both of this, these sets of training and understanding Western A. Price principles in addition to the GAPS is that we women, and of course, the women's partners 
should not fear animal fat. That is the animal fat that contains the fat soluble vitamins so necessary in having healthy fertility cycles, healthy conceptions and um, deliveries and, and being able to nurse for the most part uh, your baby successfully. That is the fat soluble vitamins are essential. So I usually try to you know, steer people in that direction. Fat, animal fat is good. Animal fat is not bad. Um, get, get these women off of the processed vegetable fats, vegetable oils. There's a tremendous amount of, of, of advertising and marketing going into producing all sorts of processed foods made with these trans fat, highly processed vegetable oils that are doing, um, you know, bad things for, for women's fertility. So get them off that. Decreasing or uh, eliminating processed uh, flours and sugars. Those are big key uh, food items that I tend to uh, draw upon also. And then what the woman drinks, beverage-wise. Um, get off the sodas, decrease the caffeinated, uh, the coffees, teas, uh, if necessary. Those types of things are all impacting um, a woman's overall fertility as well. Yeah, no, definitely. I couldn't agree more. And I think it, it can't be understated what a significant impact making changes that seem quite simple, but making those types of changes can actually do for the menstrual cycle. And the great thing about menstrual cycle charting is that it serves as your feedback tool. And so once you make these changes, it's it's great to have this this reflection of how well that they're working and uh, what is working and what isn't working for you. That's correct. And I would like to also add Lisa too, because um, we are living in a very highly modern, some people say very toxic world. And that 50 years ago, when I think about how I was raised on a dairy farm in Wisconsin, we weren't, I wonder, it wasn't exposed to probably any toxins for the first 15 years of my life. Um, but we are now, and any of us who live in cities are even probably exposed more often. I also like to encourage women to do some gentle detoxification as a way to help enhance or speed up the recovery process in addition to um, using more natural products, uh, you know, around their home. Um, if they're going to put anything on their skin, uh, it has to be a product that can be consumed or eaten because your skin is the largest organ that absorbs everything that you put on it, that type of thing. So it's like, it's you know, it isn't just the diet. It's, it's a combination of, okay, let's, let's back off these toxic substances that we're being exposed to, and let's give our body a chance to get rid of those excess toxins that it may be harboring, along with um, the toxins being produced by those unbalanced gut flora. So it's by doing those kinds of things, you can actually help speed up the recovery. So important. So very important. And it, I, I think every time I leave my little bubble and go into the, go to the mall or, you know, you know what I mean? Like when you go out in public and you just get inundated with all the smells and it's, it's really ubiquitous. It's really everywhere. And as a woman, in order to try to preserve your hormonal health, you really have to actively be focused on that. Because there's, unless you're, unless you're looking for products specifically that don't have those types of chemicals that interfere with your hormonal systems, we're all just going to get be bombarded by them. Because basically every regular product, whether it's a beauty product, cosmetic, cleaning product, unless you're intentionally looking for, for products that are free of those types of chemicals, they all have them. Exactly, exactly. And just, just a common thing that I run across when we travel, and both my husband and I are really super, well, people have said we're super sensitive, but what, what, what we found out, and I believe is actually Dr. Natasha told us about this at one of her seminars, is that when you're exposed to all those artificial synthetic fragrances, our olfactory uh, receptors actually get inundated or you know are are just profusely inundated with these these fragrances so that we actually lose the sense of smell that we have and 
sometimes we have to use more of the product in order to be able to smell it ourselves. And what, what my husband and I have found out is that if you don't use any of that stuff and you come in contact with someone who does, you can really smell it very, very easily. And it's not that we're sensitive, our just our receptors are open and we can smell. <laughs> yeah. I can oh I can completely agree because uh because there was a time uh when my before my husband and I were married when um when we were living together and we would I mean I just didn't I was just not really thinking of it I I we just we would use the regular kind of laundry detergent and all kinds of stuff because I, you know I just kind of went with what what he had been doing already you know because I I came to him and so then, you know, the typical, you know, when you get pregnant and, you know, you have a baby, all of a sudden you run out and buy different stuff because you know that the baby shouldn't have the same stuff. You, somehow you, you think you're fine. I'm good. But the baby, the baby's the one that can't handle this stuff. That's wonderful. <laughs> that we as women, who, when we become mothers, we at least are alerted, you know, are aware enough to think of the baby. Yes, but not ourselves. And then oh. as soon as we basically did the home detox, I mean, it wasn't instant, but it took, you know, over a period of time we basically got rid of everything and uh and yeah so I can completely relate to what you're saying because we used to use these products and I did not notice them and so one great example of that um before I go into my last question for you for today is that um whenever I get like a a donation of clothes because it's it's an, an, a, an amazing and wonderful thing when you have children that you have other friends that also have children and family members and so you end up getting a lot of their um, like pretty much brand new clothes, um, yes. you know, for your kids. But when they come with the fabric softener smell that I didn't used to notice before, and it takes me like seven or eight or 10 washings to get it out. Yes. Yes. And sometimes I've even noticed it because I know what you're talking about. Like literally 10. I am not exaggerating, actually. Sometimes, Just... <laughs> sometimes we, we've occasionally not been able to get rid of it at all. But I've uh, done laundry. Um, we even soak it in plain vinegar yeah, as well. And then if we have access to an outdoor laundry line and sunshine and or rain, um, <laughs> if, we, if it gets rained on a lot, then that sometimes helps too. <laughs> but yeah. it's really, it's really, uh, you know, it's, it's you, like you said, ubiquitous. But it's very, very ingrained in the, in the fabric of the material. Yeah. So much so that some on occasion you can't even actually get it out. Yeah. yeah. And those are those are hormones. Just, a lot of those substances in those uh, fabric softeners and dryer sheets and um, in the laundry detergents are actual endocrine disruptors. And for those who, those who are listening, those are hormone disruptors. So they actually can disrupt our hormones, um, which is not a good thing. And some of them are actually cancer causing. Yeah. It's and it's. You, you were saying it's woven into the the fabrics so that we can't get out. And I was thinking when you were saying that it's also woven into the the metaphorical fabric of our culture to use all this stuff. And we think yes. we need to use it. And the crazy thing is that when you're on the other end of it and you're trying to get the fabric softener stink out of the clothes and you can't get it out, you're also simultaneously remembering that people use fabric softener every time they wash their clothes. So I can't get this out, but you're going to keep washing it and keep putting more and more and more every time. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so <laughs> yeah and we don't realize that it's messing up our our fertility our hormones it was just it's so I you know hopefully this episode is resonating with you and usually I don't like to um I don't like to create hysteria so I don't like for people to be listening to the podcast and feel like they have to like push pause and go run and throw out all their stuff but if you're still using fabric softener you may want to consider putting it in the garbage tonight <laughs> I'm just, and I don't usually say that, but I'm actually saying it. I said it. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> the last uh, uh, little, little addition to that, because some of the NFP or fertility awareness providers do instruct their clients, please do not use any of those types of products on your, especially your underwear, because any of that gets in contact with the delicate tissues of the vulva and vag vaginal surfaces um, can cause irritant can cause irritation and or extra discharge that is not supposed to be there. 
Well, and some women, if they get rid of, we, because, I mean, to be real, we can't get rid of all of the xenoestrogens in the world. I can do my best to keep my home free of, you know, the majority of these types of chemicals. But at some point, I have to go outside (laughs) and breathe air. And we all, you know, drive cars or take buses or whatever it is. So we all know that air is full of chemicals. And those chemicals are also, you know, xenoestrogenic. So uh, this is not like we're under no pretenses that there's this amazing, perfect place there's nowhere in the world that's free of all of it. So, but there's a lot that we can do to reduce our exposure. So for some women reducing their exposure significantly of xenoestrogenic chemicals, kind of cleaning out their beauty regimen, their home and minimizing their exposure in general, that in of itself can be enough to see a dramatic shift in their menstrual cycle for some women. Right. right. And maybe the, uh, the ability to conceive if they're, uh, if they're you know, uh, desirous of a pregnancy. Yes. So one thing that you can do today is throw out the fabric softener. Thank you. Yes. <laughs> okay. And so, so on that note, uh, given our discussion today, what is one thing other than throwing away fabric softener that you'd like our listeners to take from our conversation? I would encourage listeners if they're still on the on the fence uh, about you uh, learning fertility awareness and using that as their mode, uh, their way of planning their family, I would encourage them to give that serious thought because I, I think there's so many benefits to using fertility awareness, the knowledge about our bodies, uh, of course, being a key, but also what the communication can do between the couple that's necessary for practicing a fertility awareness method. You have to communicate with each other uh, and talk, you know, talk about your your plans, uh, what you'd like to do, whether you want to try for a baby or not. And that that communication that is fostered by using a natural method can actually help enhance the couple's relationship. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I love that. So important and so true. So very true. An unexpected, fantastic side effect of fertility or discharting. Yes. And so I have two more questions for you. Uh, the first one, what would you say is the biggest myth about fertility that you'd like to see corrected? Um, um, I'm not sure if this would fit in the category, but I, the biggest myth that I see when women go to their physician is The physician will say, well, here, take this pill. It will regulate your cycle. To me, that's the biggest myth, that taking a a birth control pill does not regulate any cycle. It it actually destroys the woman's cycle. So that's that's kind of a myth a little bit, not quite on the fertility cycle thing. But another one that comes to mind, of course, is the whole myth about, oh, well, you can't use natural family planning. It doesn't work. And those that kind of a myth is spun from the calendar rhythm method that still is type of a comment and thought we find in, you know, in uh, the medical profession. We find it in articles and different people are still saying we, it doesn't work because calendar rhythm had such a low effectiveness rate because it didn't monitor or track the current fertility signs of a woman like the modern methods do. So that's one of the big ones I think that's still out there that needs to be squashed. Mm -hmm. Yeah, no, that's definitely. And the more I do this, the more I'm just like, and we're still there. (laughs) (laughs) Oh my goodness. (laughs) Our work cut out for us, don't we, Lisa? Yes, we definitely do. But we're working hard. So hopefully we'll make a difference. Okay, so last question of the day, then. um, What advice, if any, would you give to a couple who is struggling to conceive? I would say first, review your sources of potential uh, exposure to toxins in your immediate surroundings, your environment. Um, And we've talked a little bit about that already. I would say secondly, for sure, chart your fertility signs. Because if you don't know what your fertility cycles are doing, then a lot, you know, a lot of women just aren't timing relations correctly to even um, 
increase their chances of getting pregnant. So fertility awareness is, I would say, uh, an important feature for that. And then um, third, I don't know. Uh, sometimes I say, go to, you know, go to your physician, but I, I tend to want to pursue a natural route first. Um, there are some physicians who naturopathic, integrative medicine, who would uh, be able to work with the couple, um, maybe with detoxification and that type of thing. But that's all kind of part of the entire package. It could also mean the diet of the couple, the woman in particular. So there's a lot of facets to that picture. Mm -hmm. Yes, I think those are great words to end on. Well, Vicki, thank you so much for being here today. This was a lot of fun. I really enjoyed chatting with you. I could I could seriously just pick your brain for the rest of the afternoon, though. <laughs> well, I enjoyed, I enjoyed immensely chatting with you, Lisa. It seems like you're just next door, so it's, it's been a pleasure. Oh, well, thanks so much. And for our listeners, then, who are inspired by our conversation and want to learn more about you and what, what you do, where can they go to find out more? Okay, you can go to my website, um, wisefertilitychoices.com, or you can email me at wisechoices, and then the number 5050 at gmail.com. Okay, perfect. Well, thanks again for being here, Vicki. All right, I appreciate your interest, Elisa, and best wishes on your work as well. Thank you for listening. If you enjoyed today's show, please share it with a friend. You'll find the show notes page for today's episode at fertilityfriday.com slash 108. This interview with Vicki Braun was so much fun to record and really informative. It's always fun for me to talk to a fellow fertility awareness educator and to kind of hammer down some of the basics and to really get a sense of the interplay between a woman's menstrual cycle and her overall health. And what I particularly enjoyed as well is Vicki's training. You know, she's trained in a bunch of different methods, which is always really helpful to understand how the different methods work and the different aspects of them. You know, all the different methods of fertility awareness, whether you're using the Justice method, Billings, Cretan, or if you're using a different method, they're all effective. And there's just subtle differences, perhaps in the charting methodology, or for example, in the Billings method, it's, you know, mucus only. And so there's, it's a really interesting to see the different interplay of, of how the different methods work. And what's also interesting is Vicky's unique educational kind of background in as a GAPS practitioner specifically. And so it's a great marriage of fertility awareness education, plus having that knowledge of gut health and how the role that that plays in the menstrual cycle. And so it was really great to have an opportunity to talk to her about that and how that knowledge has informed her practice when she's working with clients and how it helps her to empower her clients in terms of um, improving gut health and at the same time, improving cycle parameters. And, you know, it's, it's, it's definitely similar to the work that I do with clients because what I do is help the clients to see that their chart is actually a diagnostic tool that can tell us a whole lot about their health and also a feedback tool. So in addition to the fact that the chart can let us know where to look, where to start, and, you know, this is wrong, this is off, or this is off, and this is where we should start. It also gives us feedback. So when we make certain changes and implement certain things, then we can know, okay, this is actually working. <laughs> okay, I see the improvement on your chart. Or, you know, I'm still seeing, an, uh, you know, an issue in this area. So I think maybe we need to pivot and try uh, looking into this uh, area a little bit more. So I hope you enjoyed my interview with Vicki Braun. And if you've been enjoying the podcast, please look for it on iTunes and leave a five-star review so that more people can find it. I really appreciate all of you for, you know, taking the time to review the show. There are so many amazing reviews on, on the on the iTunes in, in all the different countries. So I am able to see them and I do read every single one. And I just, I really appreciate you taking the time to do that. And of course, make sure to head over to fertilityfriday.com and join my email list. And of course, um, as a thank you for joining my email list, I, you'll receive a, a free copy of my ebook where I reveal what you can expect when you're coming off of hormonal contraceptives. And I also share five steps in restoring healthy menstrual cycles post pill. So definitely jump over there and do that. If you've been listening for a while, but you're not part of my Fertility Friday Facebook community, I would encourage you to head over, stop over there and join. And so you'll find that at fertilityfriday.com slash community. And so you head over there and you'll be redirected to the Facebook group. And I'd love to hear your thoughts on today's episode. So why don't you jump in there and tell me what you thought, and then we can have a little chat about it as we usually do in the group. 
And also, if you have an idea for a podcast episode or a guest suggestion, make sure to send me an email at info at fertilityfriday.com. And of course, I want to thank you for spending some time with me today and listening to the show and and supporting the show. Uh, I really appreciate all of you who've been sharing the show, sharing with your friends, tagging your friends, posting to Facebook, however you're sharing, I appreciate it. And I can see the difference that it makes. And I can see that um, the reach is, is growing. More women are finding out about the show. And I mean, that's the whole point. Um, I wanted to, to shout it from the rooftops when I learned about fertility awareness. And I, I'm, I'm kind of guided by that founding belief that, you know, every woman deserves to know how their body works, how their menstrual cycles are connected to their health. And it's just not something that's being taught. And so I really appreciate all of you for sharing the show and helping me to get the word out. Because as you can tell, I, you know, I get emails every week from women who have just found the show. And it's basically kind of that, that same reaction that I had when I first discovered fertility awareness, which was, oh my goodness, this is incredible. Wait a minute, why weren't we taught this? And oh, like, it, it really, it's life changing. And so I don't know why it's not taught in the schools, but... I'm trying to do my part to get it out there. So thank you so much for helping me to do that. And as always, until next time, be well and happy charting.